So, before I start on the border issues, uh, I just want to say Happy Women's Day, Happy International Women's Day to everybody. Um, in observance of International Women's Day, I'm wearing this little button here, which in Russian says, uh, imagine peace. I know a little bit of Russian, but not enough to know whether it, that's bullshit or not. <laughs> I'm just buy it. Um, and these buttons were made by uh, Yoko Ono for an international organization called Women on the Bridge, which today, as part of International Women's Day, held events all over the world, in bridges all over the world, and uh, including Juarez, where Gabriela, the person who I'm married to, um, uh, headed one of these events. And they were passing out these, these buttons as part of the event. So, um, it's because of that that I'm wearing it. And I really like the idea of them calling themselves Women on the Bridge because bridges were originally intended to help people keep moving, right? That was the idea to avoid um, obstacles and rivers and mountains or whatever. But uh, if you go to Ciudad Juarez, which is where I'm from, which is my city, uh, bridges are not necessarily used to keep people moving, they're actually used to keep people from moving because they're the international crossings. And so you're driving right along and as soon as you see the bridge, you know that eventually there's going to be a big traffic jam waiting to come to, to go across. And sometimes those uh, big structures that are bridges become so loud that you can't really hear anything else right there except the bridge itself and you can even hear yourself. And at some point you just gotta scream, Escúchame, speak, cause there is something I tengo que decir. A tale I tengo que contar about la primera vez que nací. When I was black, an African dream. Tenía labios gordos, I had a fat nose. Tenía un dios que hablaba en clicks and clocks. I could tell time just by mi huella en la arena. La que se llenaba con water each time, la luna llena. Slashed open the evening sky. Esas eran las noches when I dreamed with a better life. Una mañana frente a la TV screen. Una tarde spent shopping for a home style. So I rode la primera cruzada out of here. Me llevó way past Spain, hasta el palacio de Buckingham. I shed my black curl, me compré un head full of red hair. I got by on papas al carbón y coliflor al vapor. Pero entonces tea prices got too high. So I jumped on a barco y crucé el Atlantic Sea. Set up shop to vender hamburguesas y french fries. Y con mis neighbors grité, in God we trust. Para entonces ya eran los años 60. So I grew my hair tan largo como mi sister. Me puse ropa como mi sister. Caminé por la calle como mi sister. Mi papi me confundió con mi sister. Me dijo que era mujer because my sister had never been a man. So I cut off my dick with a plastic spork. Cuando terminé cutting it off, una canción on the radio told me it was time for me and my sister to vote. Pero mi mano me dolía from all the cutting I had done. Así que en vez de votar, I went down south. I forgot all about English, pero nunca me interesó aprender all that shit con acentos you had to write. Me convertí en un mexicanito con zapatitos de charol. And now, everything I do is mexicano. Everything I say is mexicano. Everything I write is mexicano. Everything I bitch, cry, moan, and twitch about is mexicano, mexicano. But American, gringo, no. But a nigger from the Caribbean. Un rick and stealing cars. Un gusano de Cuba coming over on a makeshift raft. Un 21st century frijol coming over con visa de estudiante. Not to blow your country up, but to tear it down, rip it apart, turn it out from the inside. Luego volver back home con a new attitude and a bit of green hidden in my shoe con blonde hair y colored eyes para que mi papi me confunda con un stupid mick un conquistador siempre con hambre de su share to take la mailing Russian bride que pidió about a year ago el fucking migra que denied him un permiso to get un tomate across to go see his sister die to get across un kilo de carne roja carne blanca, carne negra carne enferma for the black market not the one 
run by blacks, un beam para el siglo XXI when everybody's supposed to be frijol, un frijol to make my daddy proud, to make him forget todas las llamadas he never returned, todos los papeles he never got signed, todas las cartas he never sent, todas las cosas he never said. Oh, fuck it. Ya acabé. <laughs> for sure, because I'm probably going to be loud and spitting a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need like those uh, covers for Gallagher. <laughs> what was that guy's name? That would smash watermelons and shit. Um, so that, that was, the, uh, if I remember correctly, that, that, that was the first fully Spanish poem I ever wrote. And I wrote it about eight years ago, sometime in 2004 when um, in, in Gabriela's uh, apartment at the time, uh, we, were we were only dating back then, and uh, she was about to lose the privilege of coming across because of, uh, of some academic issues. We both were students across the border, and uh, there were some academic issues that she was about to, to not be able to cross. and. Um, it, it, it wasn't necessarily part of uh, a, a, a problem of, of, of legal legalities, of legalities. It was, again, just academic issues, but there, there's, uh, uh, it really resonated with me since um, uh, most everything that I did happened on the El Paso side, and that meant that I was not going to be able to share all that part of my life with the person I was going to share the rest of my life with. And so that's one way in, in which uh, borders really kind of impact your normal day-to-day -day life. And so I wanted to write something that spoke about all the comings and goings that happen in borders anyway, that, and, and it, that cannot be contained, and that happen just because people move, and because that's the way people exist. We exist and we move. That's what we do. Uh, but of course, across borders, some, not, 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 not only people move. Right? There's also money, there's jobs, there's uh, drugs, there's guns. Uh, and, but, uh, and it's pretty well documented that about 90% of the guns being used in the current uh, drug war in Mexico come from the United States. And I'm not blaming you unless you're drug runners, or I mean gun runners. Just don't do that anymore. Yeah, you're all cool. Uh, <laughs> But sometimes guns don't have to actually have to go across in order to, to create destruction, in order to destroy lives. Sometimes a single bullet is enough. Um, like on, on June 12, 2010, when Jesus Mesa Jr., a U.S. Border Patrol agent, shot and killed Sergio Adrián Hernández, a 15-year-old Mexican citizen, while he stood on Mexican soil. So how do you explain shooting a 15-year-old boy to death? You don't. Instead, you hide behind video game Call of Duty antics. You, try, you trade yourself in the CBP, ICE, and DHS flags. You try to become anonymous to the general public, which makes sense, since murderer would be the only applicable name after shooting a 15-year-old boy to death. So how do you explain shooting a 15-year-old boy to death? You don't. Instead, you tell stories of biblical proportions. You toss around numbers and statistics about halves and the other half. You speak of unavoidable tensions. And then you knee-jerk out, well, what did you expect? He was throwing rocks. So how do you explain shooting a 15-year-old boy to death? You don't. Instead, you squeal self-defense. So how do you explain shooting a 15-year-old boy to death? You don't. Instead, you pound your chest 
and blood shoots into your eye as saliva begins to overflow from both corners of your mouth and you even make up a little clever parody of a song to warn those who throw rocks. They will shoot you. Those who throw rocks. They will shoot you. So how do you explain shooting a 15-year-old boy to death? don't. Instead, what you do is you go home and you write down about three minutes worth of accusations, thinly disguised as poetry, so you can spit them back on the face of the people you feel should be held accountable for shooting a 15-year-old boy to death. So how do you explain shooting a 15-year-old boy to death? Really, you don't. Instead, you just shut the fuck up. And you wait, and you hope that soon enough, the rest of the world will forget. So was that probably the political <laughs> <laughs> Um Jesus Mesa Jr., by the way, as far as I know, still is an active member of, of the Border Patrol. And um, I guess his quota is not filled yet, or whatever it means. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not trying to paint him out or make him out to be a, a, a monster. Um, it's just, but uh, it, it is a fact that he has a job that, that entitles him to the chance of being a murderer which he is, and, uh, and the family tried to sue him and sue the, the United States government and the DHS, and the, the suit was, uh, was thrown out because he was just doing his job, which entitles him to murder a 15-year-old kid. And, but, but of course, in, in, in a city like Juarez, people uh, that, uh, whose jobs entitle them to be murderers are not only across the border. They're, they are all, uh, all around us, um, both on the legal side of the border, that's another border, right? Legal, illegal. And on the illegal side of the border. And um, sometimes those, uh, those people whose jobs entitle them to be murderers are also on both sides, right? They're cops by day and uh, murderers by night. And not that all cops are murderers, but you, you know what I'm saying. And one time, I encountered such a person. And I encountered him, he was a him, while he was doing his job. Uh, he was one of the illegal murderers. And I was driving home from the gym at around 9 in the morning. And I hit a red light. And the ca a car coming down the opposite way, we, we both were stopped because the other cars that were going transversely, that, that was their turn to go. And all of a sudden, a young man, mid-20s, early 30s, with yeah, a baseball cap, stepped in front of the car in front of me and raised a gun and shot the person who was driving, who turned out to be a very well-known uh, lawyer. And uh, my father's a lawyer, that's why I mentioned that, because it, it was just, you know, a bit close to home. And um, that, when you see that sort of thing, it, it never leaves you, you know. Um, I really hope no one has to see that or, or be part of that in any way, shape, or form. I truly do. And, uh, but when, right after I saw that, I, I kept trying to think about what goes through that person's mind as he's pulling that trigger, as he's taking life away. And of course, I can, I can never get even close to doing an adequate job of representing it, but the, uh, as, good, as much as I could get my mind around it, I, I imagine that there has to be this certainty that the person you're killing is absolutely worthless, right? There's absolutely nothing worth sharing this life with there which is why you're, you're, uh, you're 
killing him or her or whatever. And so I, I, I can't help but, but think that with that kind of certainty about the other, there has to be another certainty about yourself. And, and, and that maybe you're just thinking to yourself, and I'm beautiful. Estoy listo para atacar. My skin effervescent is full of purpose and tight. Futiles venas bulge up and give way to fracturas expuestas. Estoy listo para atacar. Tengo fronteras where resolutions used to lay. Tengo una espina dorsal con barbed wire going down my spine. Estoy listo para atacar. Soy todo murder y ni siquiera chance for arrepentimiento. I am all guillotine, ni siquiera spoonful de antisépticos. Soy todo rape, y ni siquiera chance for a lasting image. Soy filled with noise, yet I am silent. I am every ounce flesh, yet soy kilos de impalpable. Estoy listo para atacar. Short and violent breaths invaded that suspecting chest. Estoy listo para atacar. Empty shares. The oxido field remains, estoy listo para atacar. Remnants of todo lo que nunca fue, estoy listo para atacar. Sharp rumiantes y fat and tendons y broken legs, estoy listo para atacar. Historias and history are retold and reshaped, estoy listo para atacar. Seca sweat stain in sweet drop and sweet drop stains, frozen in midair, estoy listo para atacar. Porque solo me detengo when I'm done y solo I know cómo y cuándo acabo. Porque I've been penetrated y perpetrated, preconcebido y precariamente determinado, con espinas y Barb wire running down mi espina dorsal, estoy listo para atacar. Y nothing ever acaba, nada puede ser explicado. Teorizado, over intellectualized, axiomáticamente justificado. Reasons are mutually exclusive y autogestionables. Perpetuamente inconclusive y en flujo constante, estoy listo para atacar. Desaparezco behind sollozos and the pains of growing old y becoming un viejo. I live a través de palabras with complete disregard for spelling, grammar y contextos. Estoy listo para atacar. Print me soy mensaje, dissect me soy pasado, redirect me soy futuro, gestate me soy necesario, allow me to forget you, nunca fuiste suficiente, estoy listo para atacar, estoy listo para atacar, estoy listo para atacar. One of, or those are some of the people that uh, make my city very dangerous and make me worry about the people that, that are there. Uh, my wife, my family, my parents, my, my, my brothers, my siblings, I'm sorry, my brother and, and my, my two sisters. And, um, but now I'm here. I'm here in Tucson. And I really like it. It's, it's, it's nice place it's not home and, and I really miss my wife and as soon as I'm done with my PhD I am going back home and uh, this is just kind of a stage in my life these two these two or three years that I'll be spending here and uh, I don't really sleep a lot because I'm not home and because my wife is not here and uh, so I've been thinking about all those cities that I where I've never slept and how they are all built upon layers and archives of bulletproof speculation and free-flowing rhymes of barbed wire picket fences and fecal matter finances. Finding peace and quiet was never so suspect. Silence was never so precious, irreplaceable. Respectfully deferring position, time, and place, giving up with hands in pockets, eyes roll seen, lips shut tight, noise, ohms, every second. Noise, ohms, 
every distance. Occupies it all with amplified frequencies of nothing and no meaning, copulating until oceans of clenched fists take over the empty. The lack of syllables to enunciate. The trails of dead skin to be shed. Keep your marches. Keep your slogans. Keep your occupations and your freedom in the rest of the world radio stations. I'll keep my blade of grass and my passport in my front pocket, along with my standard-issued gasoline flask, because every single city that I've set on fire was already ripe with the stench of every color every flag has ever bled for. The red and the black. The brown and the yellow. The tipper tapper toe dance of a hundred thousand minuscule aches traveling up every spina dorsal, like fever rising, like Lucifer appealing, like mothers seducing, like Lolitas conceiving, like a 22 year old would be beauty queen squeezing herself through a through a fence past a gate in search of rock steady ground levels and a firm handshake knuckle that promises for her flat stomach a fill. Malnutrition and anorexia were never quite so empowering as when they allowed you to slip into the smallest of cracks, microscopic syringes, unaccounted spreadsheets, neglected orgasms, relinquished erections. All friction lacking tends to leave twice as much space for hunger. No children to be fed here. No birth dates to forget here. No sexual positions to be taken lightly here. And so the only city I've ever made love in resembles the hand of a little girl with four fingers missing. One by one, mutilated and consumed as proof of life, with only a thumb left intact. The bare minimum for humanity to survive. The bare minimum for humanity to be recognized as such. The bare minimum for humanity to be named humankind. But despite all digits identified, that little girl remains unknown with chicken scratches across her forehead, spelling out the anonymity of a single huella digital, and so I will name her myself. I will name her Almohada. I will name her Arbor. I will name her Spark. I will name her Flame. I will name her Propaganda. I will name her Building Block. I will name her First City Block. I will name her Ciudad like the first city I ever slept on, like the last city I will never set on fire, like the only city I will ever enter my love in. Because in the near future, every city will be a bedroom. Back alleys <coughs> will be bed sheets. Street lamps will be whispers shared. Motorcycle wheels creeping wet asphalt will be replaced by single voices bouncing off hollow bodies, expanding and coming to rest only upon finding the softest of spots where perpetual motion is no longer required, desired, repossessed. In the near future, Distances will be measured in heartbeats, and moments past will be valued in breaths. Finality will not be much more than an empty doorway, and nightfall will be taken over by the brightest of shatter, the non-commitment of breakfast by the kitchen counter, the wetness of lips as they still a kiss of a forgotten cigarette. In the near future, History books will be collections of twirling tongues and saliva drops. Your voice will travel from doorknobs to windows, from intestines to fingertips, from menstrual blood to semen scabs. The echo of your every word will, tr will trigger my every step and mi cada camino a casa, cada vez que retorno a donde nunca estoy. In the near future, I will be dead. Because only demise and decay tienen nudillos suficientes to perpetually grasp change. 
in the near future, I will no longer miss you, and I will no longer fear you. You will be my lover next door, and I will recognize your every inch of skin by smell alone. I will have no country, solo vecinos. I will have no bandera, solo apellidos. I will have no borders, only personal spaces. No tendré lenguaje sin cultura, solo labios, only throat, opposable thumbs, y un puño entero de corazón. You guys can do two more. Is that cool? Yeah. yeah? Um, my favorite word in Spanish is ojalá, <laughs> and it's, it's not a very easy word to translate. It can mean I hope, or I wish, or hopefully, all those kinds of words, but there's also a, a very strong sense of hopelessness in that ojalá. There, 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 there's a sense of whatever you're hoping for is probably or very likely not or there's a chance that it probably won't happen. And um, we, we, and when I say we, I mean me and Gabriela, we, we often discuss what the difference is of living in, in, in a city like Juarez, like Ciudad Juarez, which was named the murder capital of the world at some point, which averaged about 10 murders per day at some point. It's a lot better now. Um, but still, it's, it's, it's not where we want it to be. What's really the difference between living in a city like that and living in a city, uh, in any other big city, where murder is also a reality, violence is also a reality, there's also a chance that violence, violent acts, you can encounter violence, right? But uh, wh what we kept saying is that the big difference is that while in Chicago, in Detroit, in, in Oakland, uh, there is a possibility of encountering violence in a city that averages 10 murders per day, like Ciudad Juarez, the possibility is certain. There's a certain possibility of you encountering violence, which makes it, you know, it shifts it a little bit. And so, with that certainty of that possibility, you end up spending a lot of time saying, ojalá. You, 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 you say, ojalá, my wife will be safe as she goes to work tomorrow. Ojalá my father will be safe as he comes back home, as he goes back home from work tonight. Ojalá my brother will be safe as, as he becomes an adult in probably some of the worst um, circumstances possible. Ojalá everything fuera epic. Ojalá everyone were héroes. Ojalá el cambio exacto el jingle de las monedas, su desliz de una a una en el coin slot de salida, de todo cuando regresas. Ojalá el pavimento, the hairline fractures que lo quiebran, the feet que cantan stomp, stomp, stomp sobre ellas, the feet que cantan cuando marchan, cuando van al sur, against common sense and traffic jams, en la calle donde mi ciudad es given. As name, un apellido. Ojalá los países que llamamos hermanos. Ojalá las fechas que festejamos. Ojalá las everyday rutinas, el primer shift desde las 5 hasta 8 hours después, el PM with bloods and tits, los nocturnos desde el I didn't get any sleep, hasta la quien le importa si despierto. Ojalá los insectos de desierto. The unbearable, intocables, incorruptibles insectos de desierto. Ojalá todos were alive and better. Ojalá las abuelas nunca nos echen de menos. Ojalá nuestros carros never end up, all bloodied up, all hold down, all torn up en una random y congestionada esquina. Ojalá the streets could speak y revelar a names and faces. Ojalá my rearview mirror could scream y arruinar el suspenso. Me dijera what, when, and where, so I could break 
so I could get out and run away para quedarme en casa y nunca jamás volver a salir otra vez. Ojalá stylish custom made sunglasses. Ojalá himnos de valor humano. Valor humano que triumphs on the face of the feet. Ojalá clever contradicciones para que empecemos a recordar, para que aprendamos a respetar, para que empecemos a, a extrañar a good old better time cuando there were buenos y malos. The bad guys killed as a way of life and the good guys, well, you know, they killed to survive. Ojalá we could revive alguna semblanza of something reminiscent of normalidad. Ojalá algún final were nigh. Ojalá este final were nigh. Ojalá el final were nigh. Ojalá everything fuera epic. Ojalá everyone were heroes. I got one more for you, and then you will not hear my opinionated loud voice ever again, I promise. <laughs> Unless you want to talk to me. <laughs> that case, you're welcome to hear it. Um, there, are, there are many, many things that, that, that as I mentioned before, that, that I miss about Quares. And probably one of the strangest ones that makes me feel that reminds me that I'm not home. It's every time I sneeze. Uh, because in Mexico, and probably in most Spanish language uh, <laughs> countries, when you sneeze, people say salud, right? And salud simply means health, good health. Now it's a way of saying you might be getting sick. I wish you have good health. But here, when you sneeze, you say, God bless you. No problem saying it. I don't like that. <laughs> I, 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 I don't like being blessed. Uh, because that implies that I need being to be blessed. Right? And not only am I an atheist, which, but that doesn't really bother me. I mean, whatever. <laughs> but there's an implication there that there's something so corrupt within me that needs blessing and that needs fixing when you say, God bless you. Right? And, and that's probably where it started, right? Because I, I'm sure at some point somebody thought that if anybody sneezed, that's because there was some kind of demon going through you. But come on, it's 2012, right? At some point we gotta grow out of that. And, but, or, or not, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and, and so I, I kind of don't, don't like that. And, and I really miss just hearing salut. And, and because I have heavy allergies, and uh, <laughs> you know, so, but but they only act up on, on like hot, dry days, which never happens in Tijuana. Right? <laughs> Quite is the same way, don't worry. But uh, and, and, you know, and I, I hate sneezing because I know I'm gonna hear God bless you, and and and, and I hate being blessed, and and so I guess in 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 some ways you can say that I hate God. But uh, I, I also hate the Beatles, right? But, but I, actually what I hate the most are all those people that just go around looking for crowds to join. Mainstream whores, I call them. Now, I'm guessing this probably means most of you. So I guess that means I probably hate most of you. I once dated someone like you mainstream whore like you. She smiled the way you want to smile. She drank beer the way you want to drink beer. She got down on all fours the way you want to get down on all fours. I mean, really. She was you. And so I dumped you. On Valentine's Day, no less, because what better way to get my message across to a mainstream whore like you, I thought, than by dumping you on Mainstream day for love. After that, I hardly ever wasted a thought on you. Perhaps just a bit of awkwardness every time me and my new date, my new girlfriend, my new wife would run into you at some bar somewhere. No big deal, I'd say. You're just some mainstream whore I used to date. 
perhaps just a bit of embarrassment sprinkled with pride every time one of my friends would tell me tales about how in your drunkest states you would still talk about me. No big deal, I'd say. You're just a mainstream whore I used to date. But other than that, really, I, I hardly even remember your name. But on January 6th, 2011, a phone call made me recall every syllable in your name. And I wish I could say that I remembered you giving me great sloppy head, but I can't. And I wish I could say that I remember you telling off those stupid frat boys, yes, I am with him, referring to me, but I can't. And I wish I could say that I remember your naughty smile as I walked out of the, bed, the bedroom in that one bar to catch the tail end of your impromptu makeout session with some random butch day, but I can't. Instead, all I can is remember you dead. Instead, all I can is read you dead. January 5th, 2011, you go out looking for some beer and some fun. Three guys catch your eyes, so you go over and off with them. They begin bragging about being drug runners and gang members, so you lie and you tell them you're a cop. Maybe because you're afraid. Maybe because you're stupid. Maybe because you're just drunk and you no longer give a shit. So they showed you, and they beat you to death. Cut up your hand to make it look like something else, and by the time your mutilated body is found at some abandoned house somewhere, it's already after midnight. It's already the next day. Now, I'm not going to say that I wish I never dumped you, because I don't. And I'm not going to say that I will miss you, because really, I won't. What I will say is that while you were alive, you were invisible. Pile of dog shit for me to walk around, jump over, or scrape off my shoe if I ever stepped on you. But now that you're dead, I fucking see you everywhere. Everywhere I see you, you're dead. And I still hate God. Fuck God. And I still do hate the Beatles. Fuck the Beatles. But these days, what I'm hating the most is the fact that it took your murder for me to even remember what you were called. And that just like everybody else, it is only now that I realize you are actually still alive. So I guess that makes me the biggest mainstream horse of all. I guess that means I hate myself. Most of all. Thank you.